barely see you look back there. Uh, are you okay? I'm like, I'm okay. <laughs> I forgot you were the, you're the attack guard. <laughs> How are the gavels? Feel powerful up here. Welcome again for the second portion of the 2012-2013 Table Topics and International Speech Competition. At this moment right now, we're about to reconvene back into contest mode, so we need to abide by the rules that were set forth by our Toastmaster and the Sergeant at Arms. If you have any problems, don't worry about it. I got a team. We will take you out. <laughs> <laughs> Please make sure if you have to go outside to call your kids, your loved ones, mom, dad, pops, anybody. Please silence your phone again because we don't want any interruptions on the individuals that will be speaking before us this evening. So, with that being said, we're going to turn it back over to our Toastmaster of the evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Toastmasters and distinguished guests of all shapes and sizes, help me welcome Mr. Kim Blavanek back to the stage. Thank you, Theo. Okay, I know we took a little bit of a break, but how's that energy level? Everyone still good? Welcome to all the folks who are all here for the International Speech Contest. Okay, without any further ado, we gotta get this thing going because it's already seven o'clock. Again, we already talked about the cell phones, let's make sure they're off. Once the contest has begun, the Sergeant Arms will secure the doors. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contest. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it is determined that all the ballots have been collected. I'm going to now announce the speaking order for the International Speech Contest. Contestant number one, Carolyn Mooney. Contestant number one, Carolyn Mooney. Contestant number two, Adina Linker. Contestant number two, Adina Linker. Contestant number three, Maria Mattarelli. Contestant number three, Maria Mattarelli. Contestant number four, Matthew Fox. Contestant number four, Matthew Fox. Contestant number five, Brian Casper. Contestant number five, Brian Casper. We will now proceed with the International Speech Contest. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. Timekeepers, again, when we advise you, give me the green card when one minute has passed. After all the contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their ballots. We will now begin the International Speech Contest. <laughs> Contestant number one, Carolyn Mooney. Traumatize, traumatize, traumatize. Traumatize, 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 Carolyn Mooney. When both of the cars came to a complete stop, I thank God that I was alive. My chest began to hurt. I had severe pain. My right hand was burning from the airbags. Unusual smell was in the car. I disconnected the seatbelt 
and I opened the door. A passerby came up to my car. He said, don't move. The paramedics are coming. I could hear the siren all around. I told him that I need to get out the car because the smell was unbearable. He insisted that I stay in the car. A few seconds later, the paramedics arrived. He opened the door, and I grabbed hold of him. He said, let go, but I couldn't let go. You see, I was in shock. As I was being driven to the hospital by one paramedic, the other paramedic was tending to my knees. Suddenly, the cart that I was lying on shifted and hit the back of the ambulance. This just added to my trauma. The paramedic tried to control the cart. He almost fell on me. What was going on in the ambulance? As I was being driven to the hospital, they continued to after I arrived at the hospital, they continued to give me treatment by inserting an IV in my arm, ran an EKG, and other tests, and other chest x-rays. I was really happy, based on the test results, that I didn't have any laceration or a broken bone. Thank God. After I arrived home from the hospital, my husband I was so happy to see him because he informed me that my twin sister, my grandchildren, and many of my spiritual brothers and sisters was in the waiting room. It gave me so much joy to have the support of my family and friends. After we left the hospital, my husband said we need to go and get the things out of the car since the car was totaled. I said, no, I cannot go. My husband embraced me, gave me a kiss, and said, you're going to be fine. He didn't have a clue what I had just went through. I was very emotional, frustrated, confused, depressed. I couldn't say a word. I just wanted to put on something comfortable and put in a DVD entitled, Where You Been by Sinbad. The reason why I chose that DVD, because I knew that Sinbad could make me laugh. And that's what I needed. I needed to laugh. I wasn't depressed when I was watching the DVD, but it quickly returned. All I wanted to do was just lie in bed and do nothing. But you know what really helped me to get through this ordeal? Was Toastmaster. This magazine really helped me. It's an article in this magazine about a young lady that recently lost her job. And she felt like a failure to her family was more than she can really bear. Five days after losing her job, she was scared to give a Toastmaster speech. She wondered, how could she manage to do this after all she had been through? She thought to herself, if I could stand in a room full of family and friends and strangers and give a speech, that means that she wasn't defeated. She raised her head up high and she went on to participate. That's what inspired me to stand in front of you today. If it wasn't for the, her experience and many other experiences that I have read, I wouldn't be here. That incident that, I happened, that happened November of last year, it really traumatized me. It made me feel low, made me feel like I don't want to do anything. Fellow Toastmaster of mine, Toastmaster had really motivated me to start giving speeches, and I really appreciate that. I would like to encourage all of you, no matter what trauma comes into your lives, allow Toastmaster to help you. It will give you the help that you really need. Not only the help that we need, it provides us with a firm foundation for moving on. What Toastmaster have done for me, I would like to encourage you, please continue to allow Toastmaster to inspire you because it definitely has inspired me. Mr. Toastmaster?
Contestant number two, Adina Linger. Got Moxie? Got Moxie? Adina Linger. Mr. Toastmaster, most distinguished guests and judges. I was in eighth grade when my best friend was sent to live in a foster home on the north side of the city of Chicago. At the time, we'd met each other where we were living in Forest Park, a suburb just outside the city. I'd recently relocated from a small rural community of about only 500 people. I didn't tell my mom what I was gonna do when I set out that afternoon. I didn't share my intention to go find Veronica. Rather, I got on the green line and I went into the city, hooked up through the loop to find the red line, took the red line up into Uptown, found a bus, it was on the schedule, and with my lion heart on my sleeve, I went into a residential community I had never seen before to find Veronica. Naive? Gutsy, courageous, you decide. We had a great deal of fun catching up. We talked until dark. I didn't consider that the bus that I needed to get back to the red line might not be running after the sun went down. Didn't cross my little mind. So when we visited long enough, I put my coat on and off I went back to the bus stop and lo and behold, there was the sign that said that bus was not coming back until the next morning. Undaunted, I said, well, the red line's got to be this way. And I started my waking, my, making my way alone. I encountered a vagrant, and I asked him which way to the train. And he gave me an answer of undescribable grunts. <laughs> All right, I kept going. The next gentleman I encountered gave me an answer that was colorful, but not helpful. <laughs> So I finally called home and said, Mom, I need a ride. It would be years before she would tell me how she feared driving into the city in the nighttime to a neighborhood she had never come to to pick me up from my bold adventure. You see, I didn't realize that the park that I walked past was known to the locals as Rape a Dame a Day Park. I also was unaware of the gang activity on the west side when I just plunked myself down on that train and went into the city so casually. I wasn't a parent yet, so I didn't understand the fears of a mother whose daughter was someplace that she didn't know. The fears of her daughter being in danger and her having no control. You see, as I grew, I found out that the adults around me had fears of their own. They looked so confident on the outside, but they were full of anxiety and apprehension. I'd grown up in the country. I couldn't imagine someone being afraid of spiders, arachnophobia, aquaphobia, fear of the water. There was a pond on my property. What do you mean you're afraid to swim? Then I heard about people having glossophobia, fear of public speaking. Fear is simply that we like control, predictability. And when we don't have it, our emotions, they can get ahead of us. The science fiction writer, H.P. Lovecraft, he's quoted as saying that the oldest and strongest emotion is fear. And the strongest form of fear is fear of the unknown, what I'd set my mother up with as she was driving into the city. Now, control is something we'd like to have, but I know how to swim. That doesn't mean I'm not going to drown. Annie plays piano, but she might butcher a song at a local gig. You see, when we're afraid, we're afraid of possibly failing, being shamed, or not fulfilling those expectations society has set for us. But Robert Allen, one of the best-selling uh, best authors, says that there is no such thing as failure only feedback. Toastmasters has given me an opportunity to get critical feedback 
on speaking, something that I really feel comfortable with. I like public speaking. I like hearing how I can improve. Because I've learned over time that everyone makes mistakes. The difference between successful and not yet successful is realizing that failure is just a stepping stone, not a permanent event. So what we need to do is we need to find the courage to take that step into those unknown territories. There was recently a film that hit the box office, We Bought a Zoo. Benjamin Mee, the father in that film, it's based on a true story. He said, what you really need is just 20 seconds worth of insane courage. <laughs> just embarrassing bravery and something good will come from that. Veronica and I, we lost touch of each other. I found out recently that she relocated to Long Island and had a family. But just like you, my life was full of other adventures. Some of them kept my heart racing, like a roller coaster. You know, we're going up, but we can tell that we're just about to hit that peak and something's going to happen on the other side. So grab a hold of those rails. Let those palms sweat. Face your fear and show the world your moxie. Thank you. Can we have one minute of silence, please, while the judges complete their ballots? Contestant number three, Maria Mattarelli. Natives, ninjas, and mercenaries. Natives, ninjas, and mercenaries, Maria Mattarelli. Do you work your job, or does your job work you? Today you will learn about three company engagement models and have an opportunity to figure out which category best describes your relationship with your job. We'll talk more about that in a minute. I'm curious, do you know someone who just loves their job? Kind of like that sick, I don't understand how they could love their job so much. Anyone? A few people. Do you love your job? I got at least one back in the back. Or do you have workophobia? I don't want to go into workophobia. Would you dread taking the green line to the red line to the bus to get to work in the morning? I just take a cab. It's easier and faster. Survey.com polled more than 9,000 people, and they found that 65% of people are actively seeking a new job. 65%, that's from this wall to about right here. That's a majority of this room here. A similar survey, Harris Interactive, discovered that only 20% of people are passionate about their jobs. That's about one in every five people in this room. Can you relate to not being passionate about your job? Sitting there, every day, gets duller and duller and duller, and you just feel traumatized, traumatized, traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's explain. 
explore these three company engagement models. And by being aware of what these different models are and where you might fit, perhaps that'll help you making decisions on how to make that work environment better. These three engagement models that we'll talk about are natives, ninjas, and mercenaries. Now let's start by exploring this native stage. I went native once, it's about five to six years ago, and I was working in a company, and I got sucked in. I got sucked into the culture, all the drama, all the politics. Have you ever been there? Absolutely, it happens. You just don't know that it's happening, and before you know it, you're consumed by all these details about work that you really don't care about. And you leave work and you talk to your friends about all this stuff going on at work. And they don't care about it. Because it's not about them. They weren't there. And as you talk about all these things that happen in your day, it starts to consume you. And your job is starting to work you. Well, you know, let's take a step away from that. Let's move over to this other stage. The ninja stage. Now, being a ninja is awesome. First of all, they're really cool. But also, the ninja is different from the native stage. Because the ninja, they don't get involved in all that drama. Oh, no. The ninja is stealthy, spry. They're very effective and efficient. And they take a step back, and they look at the bigger picture. They look at everything going on, and they say, maybe a powerful question. What is it we're really trying to accomplish here? Is there another way that we could get to that goal? They don't get caught up in all this drama and all that stuff. They keep their wits about them. So the ninja stage, I think it's a pretty good stage to be at. Because you've got your balance, you're focused, and you care but not too much. Now the third stage, I aspired for this stage for years. Mercenary. Now the mercenary takes no prisoners. It's like a hired gun. You go for the highest bid. If you have an opportunity, you can make some money, you take that opportunity, you seize it. Now there's a couple cautionary tales about being a mercenary that I'll warn you about. One, there's a little bit of a tendency to be uh, a little bit of a workaholic. You gotta watch that. A mercenary might just speak at a conference in Sweden, and then a conference in Hawaii, and stop in the Chicago area for two conferences in between, within the same week. Now, I don't recommend flying from the time zone in Sweden to the time zone in Hawaii, because it will mess you up. I didn't know whether I needed to eat food, sleep, or throw up. I felt so out of whack from that time zone change. But the mercenary, got to be careful about those things and maybe get an accountability buddy to help you out, not work too much. The second cautionary tale about the mercenary is that, well, has anyone here seen How the Grinch Stole Christmas? You know that scene toward the end when his little Grinch heart grew about three times the size, broke the little box, went boing? Well, the mercenary's heart, it's that small size before it grew. And you gotta remember that human factor. You really distance yourself from the drama as a mercenary, but you gotta remember to still care a little bit. So I'm curious, which category do you fall into? Is it a native? Do you find yourself getting pulled into that drama? Do you take work home with you? Are you a ninja? You got skills? Balance it a little bit? Or are you a mercenary? Ruthless but efficient. I think a pretty good spot to be is ninja stage. Because it's not at either far end of the spectrum. You don't get dragged into too much drama. You don't not care. So I encourage you. Think about which position you're in with your relationship to your job. Maybe you need a little dash of mercenary, or a dash of ninja to add in. And as you head toward that ninja stage, please, recruit more ninjas with you.
Contestant number four, Matthew Fox. Authentic conversations. Authentic conversations, Matthew Fox. Would you have a drink with yourself? For a long time, the answer for me was no. But let me go back a little bit. Contest master, fellow Toastmasters, and those of us who've been seeking a connection with ourselves. My disconnect began in grade five. My teacher comes up to me, Matthew, you're never going to amount to anything, and you're a failure. Word for word. She had the audacity to continue to preach that message to my parents. Needless to say, she was not invited over for Christmas dinner. <laughs> but it's amazing what something like that will drive a person to do. It just so happens that at the same time I was getting feedback like that from people I trusted and believed in, technology was booming. These things, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I'll date myself a little bit. I remember having a computer in college. That was both a turning point and one of my biggest disconnects ever. I was sitting there, typing away, chatting to friends all over the world. It was amazing. I was part of a fraternity, but I wouldn't have to socialize. I, had, I was part of a swim team, but I hardly ever went to the parties or just would go to the meets and would never socialize with anyone. Instead, I had this wide world called the internet, which back then was just starting. In fact, I remember as a business computer systems major how exciting it was when Internet Explorer 1.0 came out. <laughs> For the geeks in the room, you'll love that. For the rest of you, you'll just go home and forget it. <laughs> but the point of the matter is, I never understood why I'd have these great conversations with someone. In fact, my sophomore year, I even had an online relationship. The girl flew out, we met. I didn't know who she was. <laughs> I'm like, have we met? Like, this is awkward. I, I don't know what to say to you. And you go to kiss her, and you're like, wait, there's no screen there. I don't know what to do. <laughs> but you, you leave with this feeling of emptiness. I mean, imagine that for a moment. You go out with your friends, you're on your phone. You're like, oh, look at that, March Madness. My team is losing, I just busted my bracket. <laughs> oh wait, what was your name again? <laughs> now, as I was going through that, and as I began to connect with myself, I developed certain things to bring myself back to connection. The chart here, which is not coming up. <laughs> Thank you, technology. So we're gonna start in three places. We're gonna start with disconnected. We're going to go into in touch, and we're going to end with authenticity. Disconnected. So when we're disconnected, it's like having a conversation with your phone when you're actually sitting across from Ken. I'm sorry, Ken, I can't hear you. I'm watching ESPN right now, and the Bears did not resign Erlacher. Oh, well. <laughs> but in that level of disconnection, which I'm sure we've all seen it when we're out to eat, you, you don't have that that vulnerability, that connection. Now as we're moving towards being in touch, we're a little closer. We're using active listening a little bit more. We're opening ourselves up. We're showing interest in that other person. But you may not walk away from conversations hearing what I have over the past few years. Matthew, I, I don't have these great conversations with my friends. I can't get to this level. And this is a, an astounding thing. Like, this is me thinking, how did I all of a sudden become an authentic communicator and develop these deep connections with people? And that's the last spot we land in, is authenticity. Now, how do we go from all the way over here being constantly distracted and not being in touch with people? Again, start with active listening. For example, we know Ethel has a contest coming up next week. When we see her and we touch base with her later, hey, how did the contest go? I'm sure you must have put 100 hours into that, a minimum. Immediately, she's going to come back. 
I'm assuming now, so she might kick me later. And let us know about the fact that, you know, I did put a lot of time in there. Thank you for helping me to connect. Now, she won't be that straightforward, but I guarantee, go and try that with your friends. Have that level of connection, and you'll see a radical change. But it doesn't stop there. Being interesting yourself, what we learn a lot of through Toastmasters, speech one through speech 10. By the time you get to that 10th speech, you're motivated, you're excited, the whole club knows about you. All your friends should connect with you. Your family, all these other things that you can use from Toastmasters to bring into that world. And last but not least, touch. All right, I know where your minds are going. We're not talking about that type of touch. It's not the business setting either. We're, we're not going to go into a business meeting and start hugging each other or inappropriate touch. There's safe zones, except for women. But look at how rare it is that we give each other a hug before we start a meeting or we give each other a hug after a meeting. And you see it around Toastmasters, but I can't imagine, Ken, you've ever sat there going out of a business meeting Man, that was a great hug. <laughs> but what if that culture changed? And what if all of a sudden we moved away from that feeling of disconnect? Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't just an opportunity or a speech about something I'm passionate about. It's something I think that all of us can learn from. And it's taking that level of wherever we're at on that chart, whether you're disconnected over here, stuck on your phone the entire time, or an iPhone, or a tablet. You're moving towards being in touch. And this is a situation when you're maybe out to dinner with your significant other. You might not want to be there, but you're there. <laughs> or you're in class, or even at a contest, and you may not want to be there. We've all been in those points. And then last, authenticity. Where you walk away from an interaction feeling like you can conquer the world. Feeling like Anything here, you can throw away because it really doesn't matter at that point. The only thing that matters is connecting with each other. Take some time today. Have an authentic conversation with someone before you leave. I heard someone over say earlier, so many hugs per day, give someone a hug, and ladies and gentlemen, figure out how you can become an authentic communicator. Contestant number five, Brian Casper, living life to the fullest. Living life to the fullest, Brian Casper. <laughs> Ladies, gentlemen, fellow Toastmasters and guests, thank you for having me here this wonderful evening. I'd like everybody in here to listen up. I'd like to give everybody in here a little wake-up call. The wake-up call is, I'd like everybody in here to live life to the fullest. And specifically, I'd like everybody in here to live life to the fullest by doing fun, exciting, and adventurous things with your lives. 
I know many people in here already have at least a little bit of an adventurous side. Many of us in here are Toastmasters, and as Toastmasters, we are or were afraid of public speaking. And what do we do? We come up here and we public speak. We face our fears head on. That's an adventure in itself. Now I'd like everybody in here to realize, if there's something that you want to do, you can do it. Life may get in the way for weeks, months, maybe even years at a time, and not allow us to do the things that we want to do. But we all control our own destinies. And to build off that point, I'd like to share a little short story with everybody here. So I went to Mexico a couple years ago, and when I was in Mexico, I'd go on a scuba diving trip. So I go in the scuba diving shop all by myself, and I sign up to go on the trip. And in scuba diving, you can't go scuba diving by yourself. You need a partner for safety reasons. So he gave me a partner. His name was Roger. So Roger and I get on the boat. We're out in the boat all day scuba diving. And when we weren't below the surface scuba diving, we were on the boat, riding along in the ocean, getting to know each other. And Roger told me that he is a world traveler when we were talking. And I go, okay, what do you mean by that? He goes, I wander the world. I travel for three to six months out of the year. And when I heard that, I go, wow, Roger, share your secret. How do you travel for three to six months out of the year? What do you do? He goes, well, Brian, I'm a temp accountant. <laughs> <laughs> and I live out of a garage, he said. <laughs> he goes, I rent a garage from one of my friends. And what that does, he gives it to me at a very low rate. And that keeps my monthly cost of living very low. Financially, that allows me to save up enough money to go on these trips every year. And when I got out of college, I had dreams of being a C-level executive. I wanted to run a company. I also wanted to travel the world. So I had these two things, travel the world, be a C-level executive. I thought, what do I want to do more? He goes, I want to travel the world just a little bit more than be that C-level executive. So he goes, all right, if I want to travel the world, can I be a C-level executive? He wasn't real confident he could. So then he goes, all right, I got to change career paths. I don't want to go all the way up the ladder and be a C-level executive. So he fell into accounting, and specifically temp accounting. So what he does is, when he has enough money saved up to go on his trip, he just leaves his temp accounting job, just like that. I'm impressed. <laughs> goes on his trip for three to six months. When his funds start to run a low, little bit low, wherever country he's in, he buys a plane ticket, comes back to the United States, goes back to his garage, just looks for another job, just like that, free spirit. So I was very impressed when I heard this story. I was amazed by it. I was kind of jealous, too, how he could just do whatever he wants. So I thought about his story for a couple of days after we got done scuba diving, and I learned a couple of things. One is... I just mentioned it. You could do whatever you want. Roger travels the world for three to six months out of the year on a temp accountant sale. If he can do that, everybody in here can do whatever they want. I also learned that if there's something that you really want to do, you may have to make sacrifices to make it happen. You can't just do whatever you want all the time. Roger, for example, sacrificed where he lived at. He lives out of a garage. He goes, I'm okay with living out of the garage. He said he'd rather live in an apartment, a townhouse, or a house. He also wanted to be that C-level executive one day. He sacrificed that ambition that he had so that he could travel the world. And he says, if I'm not being a C-level executive or living in a townhouse, he says, I'm okay with that. Because his main dream of traveling the world is happening as we speak. So I'd like to change gears just a little bit here. And I'd like to share some tips and tricks for everybody in here to be a little bit more adventurous. Tip number one is get the mentality that you're going to seize the day. If there's something that you want to do, you're going to do it. You can do it. If you get that mentality, you're going to breathe it, you're going to feel it, you're going to talk about it. And what's going to happen is people are going to hear you talking about it. And if they have an adventure that they want to go on, Guess who they're going to call up? They're going to call up that person that they heard talking about how adventurous they are and how they like to do fun things. So you're going to have adventures showing up at your doorstep. Another tip that I do, I think everybody in here should do as well, if there's something that you want to do, 
write it down on a little piece of paper. I got mine right here. I only got a couple things on there. And keep this piece of paper with you at all times. When you go to bed at night, read the piece of paper, put it down on your nightstand, and then go to sleep. And what's going to happen is when you go to sleep, this is one of the last things that was in your head. You're going to think about it when you're sleeping in your dreams and subconsciously. And I've had it happen to me where I wake up in the middle of the night and I have like a eureka moment. I go, that's how I'm going to make that adventure happen. I get my little piece of paper down. I write down how I'm going to make that dream happen. Then I go back to bed. Another tip is if there's something that you want to do that's real big, you may have to plan it out. Let's say you want to go to China, for example. You don't drive to the, to the west coast, swim across the ocean, and just go to China. It just doesn't happen like that. You're going to have to plan it out. <laughs> so get in front of a computer, get in front of a piece of paper, start writing the steps out that need to happen so that you can go to China. So step one on your piece of paper or computer might be get a passport. <laughs> step two might be money. You can't just go to China with 10 bucks in your pocket. You're going to need to save $125 a paycheck for the next two years. Step three, let's say your spouse thinks you're crazy going to somewhere like China. Guess what step three is going to be? Find somebody to go to China with. <laughs> so those are some tips and tricks on how to be more adventurous. And again, live life to the fullest. You only got one life to live, so take advantage of it. When you have a niece, nephew, a grandkid in front of you, when you're in your golden years, don't you want to be able to tell them all the fun stuff you did? I know I do. Do you? Thank you.
Mr. Contest Master, all of the judges' ballots have been collected. Okay, it's that portion of the contest where we're going to quickly interview all of the contestants. You can learn a little bit of something about them while the ballot counters are counting their ballots. So if the table toppers contestants could please come up, that would be great. And I do know that Matt McLaughlin had to race to catch a train, so that is why he is not up here. We'll get him his, his certificates later. Koshal Gupta is our first contestant tonight. How long have you been with Toastmasters and what club are you representing? I've been in Toastmasters since 1998, and tonight I am representing Primera Academy Toastmasters. And where are you education-wise in your Toastmasters journey? I am an advanced Toastmaster Gold and competent leader. Whoa! Wow. All right. You mentioned on your bio that one of your interests is reading. What is the last good book you would recommend to someone? The last good book is a book I'm still getting through. It's actually a book I have trouble recommending to people because it is very disturbing. It is Lolita. It is written by, I believe his name is Victor Vladimir. <laughs> Thank you. And it is about a man who when he was 12 years old, he fell in love with a 12-year-old girl and had sex with her, and she died. Not, not, oh <laughs> <God. laughs> but a few months later. But that girl was his sexual ideal for the rest of his life. So he is now uh, targeting uh, young girls. And it's a uh, very disturbing subject matter, but a beautifully written book. I will leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> we have a certificate of appreciation. Thank you very much. Uh, our next contestant was Jack. Jack, come on up. Jack, come on. <laughs> Same questions, Jack. Which club are you representing and how long have you been in Toastmasters? I'm representing Toast of the Loop and I have been in Toastmasters since July. Wow. Listed on his items of note, I once made four three-pointers in a sixth grade basketball game. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a highlight? That was my last significant athletic achievement. <laughs> What do you achieve to be your next so after that? So now you've done that one, what, you, what, you, what would you like to do? What would you, your uh, goal? I'd love to be able to slam dunk, but being <laughs> of average height and below average athletic ability, that's probably not going to happen. So I'd settle for seeing someone dunk really up close. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack, for competing tonight. <laughs> Our next contestant was Annie Long. Annie, what club are you representing and how long have you been in Toastmasters? I'm representing the Paul Leaders Club. I have been with Toastmaster for about six months. All right. oh. And I know this because I'm a member of DePaul Leaders, but why don't you tell the audience what one of your main interests are? My main interest uh, is in any kind of things that I can make improvements. For example, public speaking. I never did that before. And I was really in, um, in lack of confidence in, <laughs> in my speaking because I believe I have a lot of essence and I may not know how to use words. <laughs> but Toastmaster has given me a lot of opportunities to learn from each other and learn from every, every opportunity. I attended the meeting, I could learn many, many things that I 
would not anticipate. Our next contestant was Matthew Fox. Matthew, what club are you representing and how long have you been in Toastmasters? Aerostream over at Jackson and LaSalle, and I think it's going on eight years. Wow. You mentioned on here as one of your interests, adventure racing. Adventure racing? Yes, to, to play off the, the athleticism level that's already been established on the stage. <laughs> I went on the exact opposite side. Imagine you're, we go out to that forest preserve that I talked about before, and instead of having a leisurely stroll around, we spend four to 16 hours biking, hiking, climbing, kayaking, pogo sticking, and who knows how many other activities through the park. And basically you're using teamwork, multidiscipline endurance events, and a, a healthy dose of, I really just need to kick my butt by biking 100 miles today. Uh, and that's adventure, isn't it? Well, I've never heard of that. <laughs> oh, I don't think I'm going to go pogo through that. <laughs> Our last Table Topics contestant was Maria Mattarelli. Am I pronouncing that right? I usually say Mattarelli, but Mattarelli. it's Mattarelli, okay, I should have asked before we started the whole contest. And same question to you, what club are you representing and how long have you been in Toastmasters? Representing PMI Chicagoland. I'm also a member of the Nokia Chicago Toastmasters Club and former president of Extreme Toastmasters. Joined about a year and four months ago. Wow. <laughs> On her bio, for interest hobbies, it's work, 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 yeah. <laughs> travel, sports leagues. So if work, work, work is like that, where do you find yourself? Are you a native ninja or a mercenary? About five to six years ago, I was clearly native. And then I stealthily crawled my way over to ninja, and that felt good for a while. But I was aspiring for mercenary so bad just because it sounded so cool. And I feel like I've hit that point. That's where that workaholicism thing comes in. So I'm trying to get a little more dash of ninja in my mercenary. <laughs> I love this concept. <laughs> well, thank you very much for competing. We have a certificate, two certificates of appreciation for you for competing in both contests. With the other international speech contestants who we haven't heard from, come on up. Carolyn, Adina, and Brian. <laughs> Carolyn, same question. Which club are you representing and how long have you been in Toastmasters? 219. It's not 2009. For her interest, she says she loves public speaking and enjoys assisting others that are deaf and blind. Now, how do you get to utilize that skill? Well, I had interpreted about 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And sad to say, I kept postponing it because I didn't have to be certified to be able mm -hmm. to interpret to deaf and blind. Mm -hmm. So now I'm trying to work on my certification. But uh, I still use my skill because in my place of uh, religion, I have to tech, uh, do tactile sign to a person that is deaf and blind in the hands. Mm. Wow. wow. Hey, Thank you very much for your inspirational speech tonight. Here's a certificate of appreciation for you. Our next contestant was Adina Linker. Adina, which club are you representing and how long have you been a member of Toastmasters? I have been a member of DePaul Leaders since January of 2012. And I know very well, because I'm part of DePaul Toastmasters, <laughs> that she is a youth wellness educator, but you've got to talk about the fact that you teach 
yoga to kids, and how does uh, that work? For the last 12 years, I've been blessed to bring yoga programming to Chicago public school students. So I'm able to both show them how they can move their body for athletic or um, physical illness recoveries, things like that, but also skills that they can employ before tests, um, exams, when they have anxiety of their own. We know a lot of the kids are now being inundated with standardized testing. And my children, I have twins, they tend to freeze before exams. I fell into this work and it's been a blessing. Thank you very much. Our last international speech contestant tonight was Brian Casper. And Brian, what club are you representing and how long have you been in Toastmasters? PMI Chicagoland Toastmasters in just over a year. So I'm going to be One of your notable accomplishments, I've never met someone that I know of who was an Evans Scholar. Can you explain maybe to people in the room what an Evans Scholar is? So I grew up working at a golf course. I worked a lot of long days. And I actually caddied for a judge a lot, and I was looking for his picture. He was a tough movie. <laughs> but I work at a golf course, carry guys golf clubs, chase after the golf cart. And if you have good grades, your parents don't make a lot of money. And, <laughs> and if you have a good caddy record, you get a full scholarship to college. Wow. Wow. Wow, that's a good deal. Good to an 
individual who made significant contributions to the division in the 2011-2012 fiscal year. If it wasn't for this person, we would not have this banner. We received a new banner for achieving distinguished status as a division last year. This person chartered clubs, mentored individuals, showed people what it really takes to be a leader. No matter what happened, they were there to fill any task needed. The recipient of our Central South Division Excellence in Leadership Award goes to Theodore Trent. <laughs>
officially area governors July 1st, but they came in and took on the job after. They took on the job in August and they have been motivating people ever since. These two area governors are Area B11, Darnell Palmer, and Area B13, Governor Jack Chalabi. <laughs> just to make it to a division contest. So keep that in mind. Everyone here has done, already done really well just to get here. But without any further ado, we will have the Table Topics contest and we'll first announce third place. We'll also oh, like to I'm bring sorry, up our Donna. district leaders so that we can pass out these wonderful trophies right here. First, we'd like to call up Donnelly Williams, Public Relations Officer. Division Governor Theodore Travis. <laughs> Let the award ceremony begin. All right. Okay. In third place for the Table Topics Contest, Matthew Fox. <laughs> Thank you. 
In second place for the International Speech Contest, Matthew Fox. Representing the Central South Division at the District Contest on April 27th will be Maria Mazzarelli. who helped. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you very much to the wonderful person who, was it Anise? Who? Anise, yes. Before we leave, I want to give a special thank you to our host for the contest, 219 Toastmasters. Woo! And I would like to bring Anise Anderson up here to thank her because we wouldn't have had this room without all of your assistance. Anise Anderson. Woo! assistance and let's make this room look like we were never here. If there's anything you've got, let's make sure we leave this room clean and spotless because she is on the hook for everything that happens in this room. So let's make sure that it doesn't even look like we were here tonight. Okay. Anything else? No. The contest, the contest is adjourned. Thank you all.